The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. It's 3 o'clock East Coast time on a Thursday, and that must mean it's time for another SIGUX webinar. My name is Lori Fox, and I'm the chair of SIGUX, and I am your host and facilitator for our webinar today. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started since it's 3 o'clock. Just a few reminders about the webinar. Everyone is muted by default. The session is being recorded and we will be uploading it on YouTube next week so you can watch it again or share it. You can ask a question in chat or, oops, or in the questions window. Um, let me go back one here. And, um, we will answer them as you, um, as you ask them. And if you want to be unmuted, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll un unmute you and you can use your microphone. So if everyone would either raise their hand or say hi in the chat, just so I know you're hearing me. Good job. Following directions. Nice. Hi, Caitlin. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put your hands down. Well, the first thing I wanted to talk about, which I'm very excited about, is our annual conference coming up in November in New Orleans. Um, the conference is November 3rd through 6th. The call for proposals was just announced um, a few days ago, and the CFP is due in March. Registration will open in May. And um, soon this spring, you'll start to see more information about the conference, including keynote speakers and other great information. So I hope to see everyone submitting a presentation and joining us in New Orleans. We started a reading group. Um, we kind of just call it Read With Us. In January, we're reading together Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. We're using Slack for our discussion, and that discussion will begin next Monday, January 28th. Um, Mo Nishiyama and myself will be hosting those questions. And since we're doing it on Slack, you can really pop in and out anytime during the week. Then, because we all like to talk to each other and see each other, the first week of February, we're going to schedule a go-to meeting hangout where people can join and um, talk some more about their impressions of the book. We've already picked our February book. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, and again, in February, we're going to be working on our March book. We'll be looking for some volunteers to, um, to perhaps facilitate some discussions or come up with some discussion questions. In the Slack room already, people have offered some great suggestions for future books. So our libraries are getting bigger, and um, we're looking forward to reading together this year, um, knocking off some professional development and um, doing things together in the meantime. Wanted to uh, give you a heads up that in a, another month or so, we'll be asking for nominations for SIGUX awards. These awards are um, presented and talked about at the annual conference. The um, biggest award that we confer each year is the Penny Crane Award for Distinguished Service. We also have um, one to four or five Hall of Fame inductees. And then there are the Communication Awards where people can self-nominate projects um, or collections of documents or your social media feed to be um, judged and um, commented on by your peers. I love the communication awards because even if I don't win, I always get great feedback from um, my colleagues at other universities and it's nice to get some suggestions. I do like winning though and last year I won so that was kind of fun too. 
This is the first webinar in our 2019 webinar series, and we have some great topics coming up. You'll see that um, we just about have one per month. I actually think our May webinar is scheduled, and I just don't have it listed here. Um, but you can um, see all of them on our website, and we open up registration a few weeks before each one. Um, but since they're all at this same time of day, if you wanted to, you could um, already put a placeholder on your calendar to um, be sure to attend them. I want to remind you that you can always be a member of SIGUX. Membership is inexpensive. It's only $25. And as part of the membership, you get quite a discount on conference attendance, uh, pre-conference seminar attendance. You have access to all of the papers from our previous proceedings, conference proceedings in the ACM Digital Library. And you also can, um, in the future, participate in the SIGUX mentoring program. I'm sure that you all know the different ways to keep in touch with SIGX, um, otherwise you wouldn't have heard about this webinar and be here, here, excuse me. But just to remind you, we have an email listserv that you can join. We have a Facebook community and um, we have a Twitter feed that you can follow as well. I probably should add to here that we, ha we have been using our Slack channel. We have, um, actually we have pretty close to 50 people active in Slack which I think is good for a Slack that you're not required to use for work. Um, and we really enjoy it. Yeah, Tom Wilk, nice comment. Very awesome Slack community. We have some channels that are really active um, and it's nice to have colleagues that you can reach out to quickly. So that is it for announcements for me. As I get ready to turn things over to Casey, I will let you know that um, Casey is going to share with us information about um, collaborating with digital natives. And Casey, I'm going to work here on making you the presenter. All right. Casey comes to us from Arizona, which is probably quite a bit warmer than the negative four I had in Western New York this week. Yeah, I won't uh, talk about how it's sunny and 72 today. Is that sand or snow? <laughs> That's <laughs> snow. Let me, I have to remind myself every now and then what it looks like. Okay. So I'm going to bring my Prezi up here. Hopefully everybody can see it as it goes to full screen. I'm a bit of a... Uh, Prezi evangelist. Oh, it's, good. Uh, something that I happened on to when it was uh, still being beta tested in the field years ago when I was in the K-12 classroom. So just to give everybody kind of a, a background, um, I, I have about 20 years in education um, experience, and the majority of that as a classroom teacher at the junior high, primarily and a little bit at the high school level. So what, what that basically means is the seventh grader in the back of my head is still alive and healthy, which means that I will still giggle at booger jokes. So that's, that's just me. But this passion that has kind of welled up I like to say, because it, I think it's been ruminating and kind of slow simmering on the back burner for a long time, comes out of my experience with the classroom. I primarily taught science and social studies. And so with social studies, um, where I taught civics and citizenship is embedded. It is part and parcel of the curriculum. And I go back far enough to when we, ha uh, I can remember having a separate civics class and we, you know, we, we were taught citizenship and it was outside of our social studies or history class. But as I see, have experienced and worked with more and more educational and instructional technology coming into the classroom and more and more of our students being what uh, is officially termed digital natives that a lot of times both faculty and staff and I straddle the line between both I'm an adjunct faculty as well as an instructional designer here at Arizona State that I have a lot of folks um, who are undergraduates 
who are, for lack of a better term, clueless about digital citizenship and in a bigger term, digital civics, which that's for another time. Um, and we shortchange them in general, or at least we do hear um, that I've seen, both at the K-12 and higher ed, thinking, well, these are digital natives. They've been walking around with some sort of portable digital device in their hands, whether it's a tablet or a phone, um, for years, for most of their life. So they're fine. They don't need a basic education in uh, computer operations. I, I can't tell you how many undergraduates want to come in and take my a uh, basic Excel workshop that I, I, I give to the staff. But on, on the same, on, on the, in the same breath, they don't understand the impact of their social media activity. And we see this decried a lot, especially since um, however you voted, I think we can all agree that our current president probably needs a little refresher uh, or perhaps a full course in digital citizenship. So what I'm going to do is kind of take us through here and, and start with just what is digital citizenship. And trolling the internet and i don't i don't mean that as i'm gaslighting anyone or or fishing but when i was going around digging and and trying to see who and what has you know who's researching what have they found what's being written on digital citizenship a lot of it was focused on our elementary students things that i put in the same category as look both ways before you cross the street don't talk to strangers even though sometimes they have the best candy but don't talk to strangers things like that so you know a lot of the digital citizenship was focused on our lower elementary students and warning them about the dangers of giving out personal information um, sharing personal information on social media and making sure that the person you're connecting with on whatever platform is legitimate. It's not a front for someone else. And these are all necessary and good skills. I have a three and five year old grandchildren who are my tech support at home because they can get my iPhone working quicker than I can. But at the same time, they're, they're, they're not comprehending or conscientious of that power they so easily manipulate so it's it's kind of a personal crusade for me um, within my own family but also within my own practice as an educator so what is digital citizenship there's not a great universal umbrella answer but i borrow a lot from our more traditional civics and citizenship courses that that i was put through um, prior to the cruel and unusual punishment clause being ratified in the in the constitution but we can all agree on that digital citizenship has to do with respecting uh, the folks that are on the on the internet that we share our global world with it's about educating those who are unaware and it's about protecting those who are maybe not as strong, maybe not as wise, as astute in um, the digital world as we are. So what we call the REP um, perspective, and this is laid out in the Digital Citizenships Institute. They really go into a lot more depth of explaining the nine elements of digital citizenship, which we'll hit on a little bit. Um, but it is something that goes part and parcel with educating the whole person. This really goes into addressing not just standards that um, institutions such as ACM and SIGUX, but ISTE and EDUCAUSE and other great uh, entities have put forward as expectations of what a digitally literate individual is, but also the social emotional needs that a lot of times get overlooked because of standardized testing and that can also be overlooked because of sort of the dark side of digital educational technology. What I'm going to hopefully do in this presentation is not just explore my understanding and, and a shared understanding of digital citizenship, but some recommendations on how to integrate this and embed this authentically at the higher ed level, um, mirroring a project that I'm working with our uh, 
libraries department with on this. So why is it important? It's once you delve into digital citizenship, it's almost get a little Socratic here. I, I want to answer is why is it not important? We hear time and time again from quote unquote the real world from industry that you know graduates aren't prepared it's not just the skills it's also the life skills not just the industrial skills the the domains there but also the social ones how many horror stories have we heard of new college graduates being declined a job because of what they had on Facebook or losing a job because of what they what they tweeted on Twitter or posted on Instagram or something like that. Um, even some of our own um, faculty, more prominent faculty sometimes uh, because of what was posted on social media. Getting all of us to, to realize and appreciate that what's posted out there, even on something like Snapchat, is there forever. It's sitting there in the data banks and can be found and will be found. So trying to get students to really appreciate the power that they hold in their hand. Sorry about that. I liken it to this because a lot of, you know, I'm the old fogey in the classroom and a lot of my students just kind of roll their eyes and I'm just the grumpy curmudgeon, but I, but I'd like to give this analogy. I asked them how many of them, as soon as they turned 15 or 16, just started driving. And I get answers like, well, I got my permit, I got my driver's license. And I said, no, 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 how many of you just started driving all by yourself? And a lot of times I get eye rolls and, and guffaws going, well, that would be crazy. I have to know how to operate a vehicle. Exactly. How many times have we put a digital device in a student's hands without necessarily talking to them about what are some of the social and individual responsibilities and, and that's where the digital civics falls in. But with digital citizenship, what are your rights in the digital sphere? And it gets very confusing because this sphere knows no boundaries except the ones that are put up, like the boundaries that the Russian government and the Chinese government puts up. Otherwise, as Thomas Friedman wrote so astutely about 10 years ago, the world is flat now. And we're all citizens and we have to know how to interact with each other with regardless of ever, if we'll ever meet in person so digital citizenship is broken down by the digital citizenship institute into nine distinct and specific elements and i have them right here and it's interesting because when i talk to my students about this and i'm even on a committee in shaping edu and if you're not a part of that i would highly recommend it it is a group with numerous subgroups um, facilitated by dr samantha becker who has done some work with us here at asu and we talk about different aspects of shaping digital learning across the spectrum and part of it is humanizing learning and that's where this digital citizenship comes in and when we talk about things like access we don't we it's something that a lot of us in IT don't think about except for, yes, you have access. Yes, you have a sign-on. Just three or four years ago, students on our uh, Native American um, reservations out here finally got high-speed internet. And when I say that, I mean it finally went into their individual homes. Prior to that, they had to go to things like community centers or tribal centers where there was dial-up access. So even here in the United States, in the 21st century, we have learners that are still, still having to grapple and overcome the obstacles of 20th century technology in trying to gain the knowledge and skills that their competition will have in the at university trade schools and in the professional market so one thing we need to talk about is how do we provide equitable access to all students that's part of digital citizenship and letting individuals know they have a fundamental right to that access 
That doesn't mean, and we can argue about um, and get into the weeds about what does that mean as far as what should be subsidized, what should be provided, and what is incumbent upon the private individual. But I think we can all agree upon if we're going to have uh, digitally literate digital citizens, equitable access has to be there in some shape or form. Then we talk about commerce. What, uh, you know, there are plenty of laws established for what we might call in law or excuse me, in-person commerce, but we're just now catching up with digital commerce. And I'll give you an example. My sister was trying, uh, just this week, found out she'd gotten scammed from a landlord uh, within the state of Texas. She was trying to rent an apartment. And what this gentleman had done, this individual wasn't even a landlord, he had hacked into a property management company and was able to manipulate their listings and all the down payment and all the deposits were going into his bank account. Uh, thankfully, my sister is fairly technically a student. She was able to figure out pretty quick and rectify the situation. But getting our students to understand that just as we would provide fair trade in person, the misunderstood and misbelieved supposed anonymity of the internet and the digital sphere does not remove that responsibility upon the individuals, both the buyer and the seller. And that's something, you know, that I have to um, assure people when I sell things on, you know, items on like OfferUp or, or anything like that, most of the trepidation is, is this legit, is this real, is it in the condition that you've told me or that you've advertised it as? And what is the recourse a buyer may have? You know, as much as we would like to have unfettered markets, we can't just operate under the caveat emptor or buyer beware uh, with all of our transactions, especially digital transactions. I mean, think about it. Why do we trust Amazon to provide us with what we're buying? Other than their proven track record. How many people were hesitant when Amazon first came online? And I'm dating myself here, but I was one of them. And then there's questions now of, do you really own as far as eBooks? You know, it sits on the AWS cloud and yes, you paid for it and it's in your carousel or it's in your account, but do you really own that text. So it opens up a lot of conversation, good and necessary conversation. But again, more importantly, the awareness for our folks. And you can see that there are other uh, aspects. The ones, other ones I like to hit on are the etiquette. Uh, not only because most, most of my students don't know how to spell it, so that's a great extra credit question on quizzes, but what does it mean to practice good etiquette online? What does that look like? And it um, gets me excited because again, my, my background is in the science and the humanities. And so I get to bring in some of my old ELA lessons on, we talk about language registers. You know, what's the difference between a formal register that you might have in a research paper as opposed to a more informal that might be in a letter? You know, what is a formal register you would have in a chat group, a professional chat group versus one that you might have on your personal Twitter account? So a lot of the same understanding and practices can be adapted to our digital sphere. The last two I really want to hit on before we move on is the rights and responsibilities. Those, that's usually the green kryptonite to my students. They love the rights, but they, they don't like to acknowledge a lot of times that on the flip side, because they're good, healthy teenagers and 20-somethings, that there's responsibilities that goes with those rights. Um, without getting uh, too into the weeds, this is where I, I bring out my political philosophy and talk about, um, not my personal one, but when I used to teach uh, the age of revolution, you know, what is, I believe it's either Voltaire's or Rousseau's definition of democracy or the freedom of speech. And, you know, we talk about, you know, this person, you may not agree with them and they may even say some things that are hurtful to you, but is that, does is does free speech protect that? And that is a very hot button topic right now, especially in the political arena. So it's a great time to discuss it online because the political arena has spilled over into the digital sphere and then health and wellness. And I have never seen 20 
addicts jonesing at the same time. But at, at uh, just random points throughout the semester, I will have my students completely unplug. Now, that means in a lot of the, the classrooms I've taught in, we have desktops that a lot of them will use to, you know, take notes when really they're shopping on, on eBay or Amazon. But disconnecting from that, shutting off their laptops if they're using those, sometimes they're using both, and even their tablets and phones. And I'll only do it for maybe 15 minutes. But within three minutes, the physical signs of addiction are there. They are edgy. They can't sit still. Uh, to use narcotics parlance, they are jonesing because they feel that they are missing something. And so when the health and wellness of digital citizenship, we talk about unplugging, that sometimes being a responsible digital citizen is exercising your right to unplug. And that unplug could be unplugging completely from electronics for, for just a while, sometimes, you know, an hour before you go to bed at night. And there's a lot of new research showing that that helps with sleep patterns or removing yourself from that feed, from that discussion panel, from that. And, and here again, I'm going to, um, I'm going to date myself from that chat room or whatever we call it now. And just, just pulling yourself away from it. This is not healthy for me. And knowing that you have the right to do that empowers our students greatly. So there's a lot of ways of combining, again, holistic um, approach to educating the student with this. So as we move on more to, so the what and the how of it, at the end the, the, the bottom line, I always like to say, is that it's about people and you're connecting with people and you're communicating with people of a, a beautiful variety of people, a generous diversity, an empowering group of people. And if you're in the right group, they're going to challenge you in a good way that helps you to grow. And that's part of that rights and responsibilities and the health and wellness. But what we have to do in the digital sphere, because there is that illusion of anonymity and distance, because we're not face to face with the individual or group of people that we're interacting with on social media and in these digital platforms, is remembering that the rights and responsibilities that I, as a digital citizen, um, have and are guaranteed are also the same ones that the quote unquote other, those individuals involved in that, that chat group, that tweet, whatever it is, have as well. And there needs to be respect for that. And that's that first R, that respect. That respect that, you know, I, I think of, I believe it was the jurist, either Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. or Louis Brandeis, who basically talked about, you know, we have a social responsibility to respect other people and not yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, that theater is now moved online. And with digital citizenship, the responsibility has moved with it too. So when we approach offices like the Provo office, the libraries department, and a different academics department, when we look, when I have reached out and shared this and shown how it can integrate, it's not a bolt-on, it's integrated and embedded into the curriculum. This is what the humanities is all about, the free exchange and flow of ideas, the, the respect of the other individual, of the foreign, of the new, and the strange, and the seeking to understand through exchange. The same thing with science, the understanding, the questioning of new and possibly unobserved or previously unobserved phenomenon and trying to understand it, building that bridge. Because really at the end of the day, a quality education, at least from my perspective and from my experience, does provide you with a certain skill set and knowledge set in whatever course of study 
uh, the individuals chosen, but at the bedrock of that skill and knowledge set, that educational experience, is realizing what we don't know, questioning how we can know it, and seeking those answers in with the perspective of understanding. And that's that feeds right into digital citizenship. So the nuts and bolts, what does this look like when we're asking faculty or staff to do this? Well, it starts very simply with technology. It starts with technology, it ends with technology in the digital citizenship and helping ev all end users to remember that this powerful tool that they have access to, whether it's a laptop or a cloud server, whatever the case may be, is just that it's a tool. I usually begin my my um, semester you know, introductory lecture, I bring an old hammer that I've had with me for years and years and years. I uh, even used it when I was a cabinet maker. And I show it to him, it's just a regular carpentry hammer. And I ask, I ask my students, what is this? And they're like, well, it's, duh, it's a hammer, you know, Mr. Davis. I said, okay, all right. And I'll hold up uh, one of the, the big monitors and say, well, what is this? Well, it's a computer monitor. I said, well, how are they alike? I said, you can tell me how they're different. And, and, and they can't. And I said, these are both tools. And a tool by itself is neither good or bad. A tool builds, but a tool can also demolish. And it's up to the user how that tool will be used. So when we shoot off an email or a Slack message or we pull up our Twitter uh, during a little mental staycation from whether it's work or studies and we want to shoot something off, it's always the whole, um, as my mom used to try to rattle into the rock between my ears, think before you speak, think before you act. And whereas, you know, back in my day, you could say something and, the, and it may hurt someone. But that faded over time. With technology, we've always got a reminder. Somebody can go back and look on the history of that feed. Somebody can go and pull that email back up, things like that. And, and we're seeing how that's affecting our um, political and public figures today who, you know, didn't filter or didn't think. So getting our students to do that and embedding that in the classroom because every track that students could possibly conceive of to study, especially at, at higher ed, but even in K-12, there is a component of communication, especially professional communication, and that's where digital citizenship comes in. We can address that, not just teach them the form of a, of a white paper or a business proposal or an article abstract, but also how do you communicate with a colleague? How do you communicate with someone above you? you know, a boss, how do you communicate with a subordinate that can be professional but collegial at the same time, that's respectful but also engaging without getting convoluted in things, uh, a, a lot of what Orwell called doublespeak. So I've come up with four kind of actions. And of course, it goes back to the whole thing about how do you get on Broadway, practice, practice, practice. How do you become a good digital citizen? Well, practice, practice, practice. And this is what I have my students do. And it's something that I'm working with our uh, first year success folks, uh, along with first year librarian, of trying to form moderated um, groups within Canvas because that's the LMS that we have transitioned to that are overseen by set faculty and staff and help. It gives kind of a, for lack of a better term, safe space for students to practice this digital citizenship. So what does that look like? Well, that moderator is going to start the discussion and moderate the discussion and model, you know, good digital citizenship. And sometimes, as I share with my students, being a good digital citizen does involve things we don't want to do, such as calling out a fellow user, a colleague. That's not right. You could, that could have been worded better. That was stated in a hurtful way. You know, taking it very objectively. The second one is embodying a positive attitude. And I have found this to be very helpful, especially in, in dealing with faculty, because in a way we are asking them to do add something else to their curriculum. 
excuse me, but it's something that I would argue as a 15 plus year veteran of the classroom should have been there to begin with. We cannot assume that our students, especially our university students, are coming from the same background and have shared or similar experiences socially or emotionally that we perceive the student body of having. So if we embody a positive attitude as we take this to our faculty and staff, it will be seen as not merely yet another thing I have to do, another item I have to check the box on, but here's a way to help have a positive impact with our students and not in just an academic way, but in a social emotional way. One of the best things I was ever taught was by one of my first um, principals I ever had. I taught in South Oak Cliff in South Dallas uh, in Texas, if anybody's familiar with that. And it took me a semester to finally break down my pride to, to question my, my principal, why can't I connect with my students? I want to help them. And she told me two important things. She said, Mr. Davis, first, nobody will care what you know until they know you care. Now, that doesn't mean I was, you know, diapering them and patting them, powdering their tushies and things like that, spoon feeding them, but embodying and displaying, demonstrating, I really wanted them to learn. I really did care about them for those eight hours that they were with me or 10 hours sometimes for before and after school that I did have a vested interest in their not success, not just this year, but in years to come. And, you know, for, for a, a hard headed 30 year old that, that, that didn't quite sink in. And I think that wise woman could tell, and she looked at me and she told me very bluntly, she goes, Mr. Davis, you need to know this. She said, you're probably, for these students, the first white man they've seen that's not wearing a badge. That clicked with me, and everything started to fall into place. Now, I'm not saying it was smooth sailing, but my students and I were able to reach an understanding, a mutual understanding. So by embodying that positive attitude, I'm not talking Pollyanna. I'm talking about an authentic attitude, the same way I finally got them to, to, I could show them and explain to them that I was there for them to be successful and to be successful in more things than ESL or language arts or social studies or science, whatever it may have been, but I wanted them to be successful humans. When we embody and adopt this, this approach to digital citizenship, then when we go out to, for lack of a better term, to evangelize, to spread this, our colleagues will see it too. And they will see it as more than just another thing. Maybe not at first, but they will see it. The practice of personal responsibility, and this kind of goes along with the other two, is, you know, we're going to walk the walk while we talk the talk. Our emails are going to be civic-minded. They're going to show a display of digital citizenship. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be stodgy, that they're going to be fusty, dusty, and old. You can still have fun. And in fact, um, quick little pitch here, Lori and I are, are hopefully will be, will be submitting a proposal for uh, the SIGUX conference this coming November about how to use humor and technology and how to do it, not just safely, but in an authentic and an engaging way. And I have found that humor is a great way to help practice that personal responsibility because nothing speaks louder to our audience than when we own our mistakes and use it as a teachable moment. And trust me, that comes from many, many years of making many mistakes in front of my students. And that breaks down a lot of barriers. And then the last one is, again, just being a leader. That doesn't mean that we all have to don the cape of, you know, uh, moral Superman or Superwoman. But what it does means is, means for us is to say, hey, I, 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 I think this is a better way to do this. And I think if we all pull together, we, we you know, we can make it happen. Now, a lot of times trying to get faculty together, trying to get staff together, is kind of like the Avengers. We've got a Hulk. We've got a Tony Stark Iron Man. We've got a Captain America. And 
These are people who probably, given half a chance, would rumble in the back alley. But we've got to get them moving in the same direction. And when we can be a leader by our actions, well, it very naturally, people will fall into place because when we show them you know, and display that what we're doing with this digital citizenship is truly for posterity's sake. You know, when it when it finally hit me in the classroom, and I still talk, uh, tell my share my students with, you know, uh, share this with them, because uh, I'm I'm not a prototypical college professor in some ways, and they're very shocked that I do care about their well being in general and their academic success. I'd like to tell them, you know, you're my retirement. Okay, I'm not going to get rich off education. I'm going to make a living, but you guys are my retirement. You guys are going to be working and running the institutions that are probably going to be taking care of me when I'm old and debilitated, whether that's the nursing home or the federal government. But you are my retirement. And I want to make sure, and this, and this is very selfish in some ways, but I want to make sure I have a good retirement. And that helps to get them a little more oriented. I think it helps that I'm, I'm the age of some of their parents and even some of their grandparents for the real young ones, but that helps them to, to really kind of see past themselves, which at the end of the day is really what digital civics and citizenship is all about. And when we partner with digital natives by respecting their experience, respecting their opinions and their point of view and their perspective, we'll see that we have a lot of common ground to move forward on. So that's the end of my spiel. I want to remind everyone that come November 2020, vote early, vote often. I promise a chicken in every pot. And I am open to your questions. Well, I missed a question from Tom back on the nine elements. Can we go back to the nine elements? He wonders, is there an order to these elements? Are they in priority order? You know, that is a great question. And I asked myself the same thing when I first came upon these doing some initial research. And I can't find there being any type of um, memo, you know, what we might call intriguingly a smoking gun that says these were put in in a particular order for a particular reason. So I don't think, I'm sure there was probably some thought behind it, but I haven't found okay. what what that uh, train of thought was. It's kind of alphabetical, but not totally. It is, and I would recommend anyone who really wants to dive into that going to the Digital Citizenship Institute. And if you Google that, um, that should be one of your top three, if not the top uh, result. And they give a little bit more of a deep dive and explanation Okay. Uh, for each one of these. Nice. Does anyone... this is... Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, this is a fun one that I have. Um, again, in the classroom, I have my students do a lot of group work together. These are a lot of future teachers is uh-huh. the majority of who I teach. And I'll make groups of nine and they have to go out and be able to sum up what their assigned element is using maybe an app icon (laughs) or something like that. Does anyone else have questions for Casey? I put everybody to sleep. I'm used to that. No, I got to tell you, I really enjoyed listening and paying attention and taking a break from work. I actually, (laughs) you know, as part of, although I did miss Tom's question, I will admit that, but as part of facilitating, I really let myself spend time to pay attention. And I'm really glad I did. Thank you for sharing all of this great information. And um, I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed the opportunity. And I want to, again, thank ACM and SIGUX and you, Lori, and I know uh, Alan and Irene have yeah. been working in the background on this for, for making this possible and inviting me. Roxana said, very well done. I enjoyed this webinar. And Caitlin says, thank you as well. So, well done. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne and Caitlin. I appreciate the compliments. 
All right. Well, at that, with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and end this webinar. Like I said, it will be available on our YouTube channel next week. And um, Casey, I'll be talking to you soon. That sounds great. I uh, wish everyone a good afternoon. And I hope for those of you in the, in the North that spring comes soon. <sighs> That's a good wish. All right. Everyone take care. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.